Gutman. Welcome to Scandinavia, Mia Krasinski. Welcome. Pleasure to be here. Um, and, and you come, you come all the way from 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 the University of. Uh, you're you're a pioneer behind a method that we're going to talk about now. Because show now, uh, I gave you access to my fa to not to my whole Facebook profile, but who to who I follow on Facebook, the pages that I follow, and 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 from that, and in like a second, you can map my personality. Milliseconds. Millisecond. Millisecond. You can map my personality. It's not 1980s anymore. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, no, because, because it was like, you can tell a bit about what you found, uh, but please be kind. Well, when people use social media and other digital uh, environments, digital devices like smartphone, smartphones or Facebook or Google, uh, web browsing and so on, I think we all kind of realize a lot of information. Now, if you donate to a given politician, kind of, you probably understand that now your bank will know what your political views are. If you have listened to, you know, Lady Gaga 40 times yesterday, you realize that Spotify, you know, knows you're weird. Uh, but also, <laughs> Spotify will <laughs> know your music taste. But what my research shows is that you can also take data of this kind, like songs you have listened to, your Facebook likes, your tweets, and so on, and reveal that you th perhaps didn't even realize you're revealing. So imagine a person that has never really talked about their political views online, never shared anything related to politics, never donated any money, uh, uh, and even in their private related to politics. Now, our models can look at their Facebook likes or the music they listen to and still with very high accuracy infer what their political affiliation would be. And not only political affi affiliation. That's correct. We can look at their personality, we can reveal their personality, intelligence, happiness, city sexual orientation, whether their parents uh, were together uh, or not, what drugs they are taking and a wide range of other intimate traits. And how did I score? High openness, which means that you tend to be open-minded uh, to new ideas, maybe sometimes interested in poetry or musicking. Uh, low extroversion, meaning that you like your time alone, uh, reading books, uh, maybe writing from time to time. Why do I have this job? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> and emotionally stable. That's, uh, that's a very nice trait to have which means that you're not very easily stressed. Very good uh, trait to have when uh, appearing on a TV a lot. But how, from, from which likes can you say that I am emotionally stable? Well, every single particular like, everything actually you do online or offline as well, is in some very tiny way related to your psychological traits, to your political preferences, to your religiosity, to your intelligence, to your age, gender, and all of the other traits that you have. In other words, behavior is not random. There's always a subtle connection between different aspects of our life. Now, some of those things are really obvious. Let's say, if you told me for whom you voted in last election, please don't, mm. uh, and I knew anything about Swedish political scene, I would be able to conclude uh, with high accuracy what your political views are. But now if you told me what music you listen to, I probably would have trouble linking music with your political views. Now, it does not mean that there's no connection. It just means that this connection is too subtle for human beings to perceive. Now, the algorithm has an advantage over human beings, which is that it can look at millions of people and spot little tiny correlations that for human beings wouldn't be really visible. And it may conclude, for instance, I'm making it up, that you know, listening to Lady Gaga is correlated to a tiny degree with being liberal. Now, it does not mean that if I just know about you, hey, you listen to Lady Gaga, I automatically know you must be liberal. Not at all. I just got this little tiny piece of information. But now what algorithms can do, they can combine hundreds or thousands of such tiny pieces of information to arrive at the very accurate image of a given person. So, so how is this useful? Matching people with jobs, uh, detecting psychological problems, um, marketing. It's being very widely used these days uh, in marketing, where marketers try to figure out what the profile, not of a given group, like, again,
you marketers would look at a whole group of people, say people who read Reader's Digest, and then decide that, okay, this group is, has certain characteristics, so now we target certain adverts uh, at this group and also use certain language or uh, try to influence them uh, with a particular message. So ads tailored for you. And now the ads are tailored just for you, and it can be just an ad that, in fact, just you, the only person in the world, will see. And, and uh, is, I mean, this, this information that, that you provide, um, it's, it's valuable, right? How can it be commercialized? Oh, it's, well, the, in the digital footprints we generate while using internet and other digital products and platforms is extremely useful. Think about things that people take for granted, like Google Maps. If the information that we all contribute to the system by using Google Maps is then used f to detect where there's traffic, what's the fastest route from point A to B, and the system, in effect, solves a big problem that society has, which is getting people from point A to point B while burning the least amount of fuel and in the shortest possible time. So your data here is really valuable, not only to you, but also to the society. So when you hear people talking, oh, you know, I want to withdraw my data, I want to control my data, I don't want to share it with anyone, I can understand this sentiment, I feel the same. But then on the other hand, I think we need to realize that your health records, your browsing history, your location in geographical space, and even the movies that you watched in the past are being now used not only to improve your experience, like in terms of Netflix or YouTube, but also to treat disease and prolong people's lives or find new medicines, like in terms of people's health records. It, it has been a, a big discussion whether the method that you developed and, and, and similar methods has played a part in elections. Um, and I'm thinking about the US election and the Brexit election. What are your thoughts on that? How, how, how much a part did it play? Well, I think this is a fact of life that psychological targeting of political messages is now playing role in politics. And in fact, it's being used by two sides of the political spectrum. Uh, not sure if you guys remember, but Barack Obama was the first politician to use uh, social media and psychological targeting on a large scale. So obviously it plays a role, but does it give unfair advantage to any side? You know, both sides are using it. And in fact, let's say in 2016 election, we have seen Hillary Clinton using, spending way more money and hiring way more uh, uh, way better experienced people to run her online campaign. So you would say that actually she had an advantage uh, when it comes to online marketing. And I also think that it's not all bad because, look, targeting the political message to your psychological traits, trying to uh, talk about your dreams, talk about your fears, talk about your interest, makes the message more relevant. And when the political message is more relevant to a person, to a voter, it makes the voter more engaged, drags him into the political process, which is absolutely great. And we've seen it in 2016, both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump attracted a lot of attention from people who traditionally didn't vote. And I think in the long term, having people being more engaged with politics, it's, uh, it's a great thing. Can it also be used to get people from voting? Uh, that's unfortunately what seems has happened in last election as well. So one of the candidates used psychological targeting to find voters of his opponent uh, that were perhaps you know, wondering whether they should go and vote or not and spent a lot of effort trying to uh, convince them to abstain from voting. But one thing has to be said here that it's you know, using immoral techniques and behaving in an ethical way. You don't need social media to do that. You can, you know, we have a lot of experience uh, with traditional TV and traditional newspapers being used to lie to people and try to manipulate them to do things that you know are not good for them. Do, do, do you think that methods like this will ever end up in your museum? Well, we have, I have the Google Glass in my museum. It's, it was an innovation failure. The technology was brilliant, but um, Google on, the, on, on, your, on your glasses. And it was banned. It, cafes in San Francisco had signs saying, welcome in, if you don't have the Google Glass, because people don't like to be 
uh, for taking pictures of or, or, or seems, being on video all hot. the time. So it's a privacy issue. So obviously it could be a backlash, definitely. <laughs> Welcome Seems to my hard. museum, then, uh, <laughs> the future. I should, I should move in, <laughs> move my whole love. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for coming. <laughs> no. Uh, I know you have a plane to catch, so... But thank you, anyway.